good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin and I am the coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange with the University of Florida. Today we're excited to have our guest speaker Dr. Natalie Wagenbrenner with the Missoula Fire Science Lab. Today Natalie will be giving a presentation on the Wind Ninja wind model. I would like to take just a quick minute to share a bit of information about the program I work with, the Southern Fire Exchange. SFE is a regional program for fire science delivery in the southeast, where a collaboration between the University of Florida, Tall Timbers Research Station here in Tallahassee, and NC State University. We're part of a very successful nationwide network of fire science exchanges hosted by the Federal Joint Fire Science Program. You can see there on the map. We exist to increase the availability and application of fire science for natural resource managers and to serve as a conduit for fire managers to then share their research needs with the science community. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Natalie. Natalie completed her undergrad in biological engineering at the University of Missouri and her MS and PhD in biological systems engineering at the Laboratory for Atmospheric Research at Washington State University. Natalie has been with the Fire Lab, the Missoula Fire Lab, since 2010, and she's currently a research meteorologist there, where she's the technical lead on the Wind Ninja model. So if you have questions, this is we've got the person to ask. Her research focuses on measuring and modeling the atmospheric boundary layer in complex terrain. So welcome, Natalie. Thanks so much for taking the time to, to join us today. I know we're all looking forward to your presentation in, in one moment as I go ahead and pull up your slides. Okay, thanks David for the introduction and I guess I'll go ahead and get started now. Uh, so today I'm going to give a, a quick introduction and overview of the Wind Ninja model. Um, so Wind Ninja is a tool for simulating the mechanical and thermal effects of the local terrain on the wind field. And, and I realize that there may be some uh, listeners today that maybe work in areas uh, where the terrain is not so complex and you may be wondering if Wind Ninja has anything to offer you. And I think the answer is uh, probably yes. And so I'm gonna touch on some of the features that you may be interested in um, probably in the second half of the presentation. So just to give you an idea of what we're going to go through today, first I'll talk a little bit about some of the motivation, the background for, you know, why this tool was developed in the first place. I'll give a, an overview of the Wind Ninja framework. I'll talk a little bit just briefly about some of the, the field work we've done to um, conduct some model evaluation work. Uh, I'll talk about some of some of the other uh, Wind Ninja features um, that I just mentioned a second ago. And then I'll talk about uh, some new stuff that we have going on. Uh, and then at the end, if we have some time, I'll do a quick uh, demonstration of the model. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to talk about, you know, why is there a need for a tool like this in the first place? Why is there a need for high resolution winds and complex terrain? Uh, and there's, there's several reasons. Um, so one is that wind is typically the most sensitive input parameter for fire spread calculations. We know that uh, wildland fire and the fire models that we use to predict uh, wildland fire spread and behavior are particularly sensitive uh, to the near surface winds. We also know that wind is the most, often the most dynamic factor in the fire environment. Um, it's highly variable in both space and time, particularly in complex terrain, uh, where you may have, you know, ridgetop winds uh, behaving very differently than say winds in, the, in a nearby valley, for example. And we know that a, a change in either wind speed or wind direction can have a dramatic impact on fire behavior. Uh, most of the fire behavior models in use today directly use uh, what we refer, refer to as a mid-flame wind speed as an input. Uh, so we have a real, a real need to uh, be able to predict uh, near surface winds and complex terrain. So the ultimate goal is just a, uh, a tool for um, better wind predictions and ultimately more accurate description of fire behavior. So as I mentioned, uh, the w winds are um, highly variable in, in space and time in complex terrain, and this is true for a number of reasons. Um, there are uh, terrain-induced effects in complex terrain, both mechanical and thermal effects uh, that affect the, the near surface uh, wind field and complex terrain. So mechanical effects include things like speed up over ridges, channeling into valleys, uh, recirculation on the lee side of a, of a hill or a mountain, uh, thermal effects uh, include things like diurnal, diurnal flows, um, so 
upslope flows during the day and downslope flows during the night, which occur just simply to uh, differences in the rate of uh, surface heating and cooling uh, compared to how the atmosphere um, heats and cools during the day. So if, for an example, uh, on, a, on a warm, sunny summer day, when there's lots of incoming solar radi radiation hitting the surface, the ground surface will warm faster than the air above it. Uh, and so the, the warm air at the surface will, will tend to rise just due to the difference in the buoyancy of the air parcels and that near surface air will start to creep up slope. The opposite effect happens at night uh, when you have the surface cooling faster than the air above it and that causes the air right near the surface to cool faster than the air above, above it and becomes more dense and tends to slide down slope. Uh, and these kind of effects are difficult to anticipate, uh, even for experts, just because there's so much going on. These effects don't happen in isolation. Um, they happen at the same time, and so you can have some interesting combinations of, of things happening in complex terrain. And observations are sparse. Um, so, you know, if you have an observation in one point, you know, on a ridge top or in a valley, it may not be representative, you know, in the next valley over or on the next ridge top over. And modeling requires very high spatial resolution to capture the terrain features that we care about. So individual uh, drainage and drainages and valleys, um, for example. So the you know typical um, like operational numerical weather prediction models that you might look at, um, you know, if you go to like NOAA.gov or or the Weather Channel or something, those models are just run at too high, too coarse of a spatial resolution to capture these kinds of effects. So here's just a quick example um, demonstrating how the uh, local terrain induced effects on the flow can affect fire spread. So here we're, we're looking at two fire simulations, uh, two hypothetical um, fires, um, fire simulations over an isolated hill. And you can kind of make out the, the light gray lines are the, are the uh, contours of the topography. So the hill is running, the axis of the hill of the ridge is sort of running uh, from the northwest to the southeast. And the prevailing winds in the simulation were coming from the southwest. So on the left, we have the, um, the fire uh, um, perimeters that you get um, if you just use you know, a uniform wind uh, for the simulation. Um, so you see you just get typical fire spread um, up and over the hill um, and straight you know, from the southwest to the northeast. On the right hand side, we're showing the simulation uh, that you get, the, the contour lines that you get with um, a gridded wind simulation where, where we have uh, gridded winds showing uh, slower and slower speeds and, and recirculation on the lee side of the hill. So you can notice the, um, the differences in the, in the propagation of the fire on the lee side of the hill are, are pretty dramatic. So wind information is used in a variety of ways um, on, on, in wildfire applications. It um, can be used to feed numerical fire spread models like what we just looked at in the previous slide. It's also useful just for on-the-ground firefighters, just for uh, being able to visualize uh, what the wind field um, looks like uh, spatially in the area that they're interested in. Uh, it's useful for management planning and for, for fire investigation, so for sort of recreating, reconstructing um, previous wind patterns. So there's basically three sources of, of weather or wind data um, available to fire, um, fire managers typically. So there's on-site observations. Um, so you might have a person uh, with a, you know, with a wind sensor that can make measurements at a, at a certain point and report on that. Uh, automated weather stations such as, as RAS um, or, or predictions from weather forecasts. And there's pros and cons to, to each of these sources. The first two, um, one of the drawbacks is that they're just point locations. Uh, and since we know that the wind is varying, um, you know, a lot uh, in, the, in the complex terrain, the, it's, it's hard to ex extrapolate um, measurements made at one point to another point on the landscape. Uh, the drawback to the weather forecast is that they're both spatially and temporally coarse. Um, so it would be great to have a tool that can quickly but accurately generate gridded winds from point observations uh, or, or from coarsely gridded winds. So 
the usual options on uh, on say a fire incident um, for wind information is either a, a uniform wind over the entire landscape from some general forecast, say from a weather model uh, or point observations. And then that means that the small scale terrain effects are largely left to the experience of the local user, which is a real problem because as, as I mentioned before, it can be really difficult to anticipate um, the mechanical and thermal effects and their interactions and what what might be actually um, happening on the ground. And so, you know, just as an example here, maybe you have a known measurement at location A, but what you're really interested in is what the wind is doing in one of these, you know, one of these valleys um, in another part of the domain. It can be really hard even for an expert to sort of judge um, what the, you know, what the wind observation at A means for another point on the landscape. So our work is focused on creating another option, uh, and that's generating high resolution gridded wind forecasts from the other information that's already available. And as we did this, we um, followed a list of requirements because we're, this is all targeted for um, operational wildland fire applications. And so these are some of the basic requirements that we wanted the tool to meet. Uh, we wanted to gener generate accurate near surface winds at spatial scales that are relevant for fire spread. So tens to hundreds of meters. We wanted fast simulation times, wanted it to run on simple hardware such as just a laptop computer. Uh, simple user interface, so it's not complicated. Uh, people don't have to spend a lot of time figuring out how to use the tool. And we wanted flexible initialization options uh, based on the available information, the best available information. Um, so that might mean the ability to downscale weather model forecasts using uh, information from raw stations. And then uh, the ability to just do some what if scenarios. So, you know, just saying, okay, what if in general the wind is, you know, 10 meters per second from, you know, from the southwest. And in response to that need, the Wind Ninja model was developed. I think the first version of it was released in 2007. Uh, so we're now, the current release is 3.1.1. So we've had many releases since 2007, lots of improvements, new features being added. So the model is uh, under uh, constant active development um, by myself and others here at the Missoula Fire Sciences Lab. And so now I'll give uh, just a brief overview of how the model actually works. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this here and then each of these pieces I'll kind of touch on a little bit more uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, so what we're looking at here on the right of this slide is just uh, what the what the user interface looks like when you when you launch the the desktop application. This is sort of what you see, and it's pretty easy to just sort of you know you step through all of the options, and you know in in a couple of minutes you can pretty quickly figure out uh, all the steps you need to do a quick simulation. So the first thing when you open the this window here, when you launch the application, uh, you get an option for the type of solver. And this is new um, in, since version 3.0, which was released in May, we now have these two options for solvers. And I'll talk about them more in a minute. But the solvers, uh, that's the number crunching part of Wind Ninja. That's the part that's actually simulating the mechanical effects of the terrain on the flow. Uh, and then we have a couple of options for parameterizations for thermal effects that can be optionally turned on and on or off. I think we generally would recommend that, that they be on, but if you have some question about um, if they're appropriate for your scenario or, or how much difference they're making for a certain case, there's the option to enable or disable them. And I'll talk more about how they work here in a minute. And then we require basically three inputs to do a simulation. We need some gridded um, terrain information, so a, a gridded, a digital elevation model. Uh, we need some information about um, the general flow in the area, so we need an initialization when we allow three options for that. Uh, and then some information about the vegetation, and that can be either gridded information uh, or just um, some average description of the vegetation in the area. And all of these inputs um, are, are um, we're able to download those or fetch them remotely from the Wind Ninja application. So you can actually launch the application and do a simulation from start to finish without doing any work ahead of time. So you don't have to do any data assimilation or um, you know, building files or anything to do a run. You can just sort of launch the application, have it fetch the information that you don't already have, uh, and do your simulation. 
And then for output products, we offer a number of different formats um, that are useful depending on what your specific application is and what you're trying to get out of it. Um, probably the most popular output format is just the KMZ, which is a file that's viewable in Google Earth. Uh, it's probably the quickest one to visualize. Um, we also can output raster and shape files that can be read um, in any GIS application. The raster files are also in a format um, that can be read by many of the uh, fire behavior models like Farsight. Uh, a newer output and maybe two releases ago was the Geo PDF output. Um, so we wanted to do this because a lot of people um, on fire incidents have been using the Avenza PDF maps on their phones. And this is a good way, if you do a simulation, if you have access to a laptop, you can do a simulation, export the Geo PDF, load it in your phone, and then you can view it later um, when you're maybe away from the laptop, you can still view it on your phone. Um, the VTK output is, uh, is just a 3D, as a 3D representation of the of the solution of the flow field, um, that most most fire managers probably don't don't use that, but we do we do offer it if anyone's interested in the, the actual 3D um, final wind field. And then there's also this CSV, so just a comma separated value um, output is also possible, where you can just specify, say, I just want uh, the outputs at these X Y Z points, and and we can also output that. So I mentioned that there's three options for initializing the model. Um, the first option, the simplest option, uh, is what we call a domain average uh, initialization. And in that case, you just specify an input wind speed and direction at a given height, and we generate the, the gridded output. The second option is what I'm showing here. That's a point initialization. And this is what you would do if you had, say, one or more uh, weather stations, so places where you have information um, about the wind speed at point locations. And we can use that information at one or more points Points, and they don't even actually have to be within your domain. They could be slightly outside of the domain uh, to generate the, the, uh, the gridded wind field. So you can see an example here where we have uh, wind speed information known at these two stations, station one and station two. And we use that data uh, to initialize our simulation and get this gridded output, output that I'm showing here. The third option is what we call a weather model initialization, and that's where we uh, use a coarser scale gridded weather model, such as uh, that you might get from uh, NCEP um, or you know one of one of the NOAA models, basically, uh, to initialize a simulation. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how it actually works, how we go from those, those point or those coarser grids uh, to the final high resolution gridded fields that I was just showing there. And um, this is basically how it works. So here I'm showing an example where we have a small, uh, an isolated hill or a mountain here. We're looking at a side profile of it. And the first step is to build a 3D model of the air, what we call, so we call the 3D model a mesh um, of the air above the terrain. Uh, and so you can see here what we have this mesh that has these, um, these cells. Um, and, and you can imagine here we're just looking at a 2D profile, but you can imagine that uh, the, the cells go into and, and out of the page. So we have a 3D representation of the, of the air above the terrain. The second step is to prescribe an initial wind field, uh, which is what I'm showing here with the blue arrow. So every cell in the mesh gets prescribed an initial wind field, and that's strictly based on one of those three initialization methods. So if it's a domain average run, we basically assign um, that, that wind field, that domain average value gets assigned to every cell um, in this mesh here that I'm showing. And then the third step is to compute the final mass and momentum conserving wind field. Um, and so when we when we run run the solver on that initial on that initial wind field, we end up with something like what we have here with the red arrows. So the blue arrows are the initial wind field. The red arrows are the are the final is the final wind field that comes out of the wind ninja solver. And so if you look at if you look at one of these these uh, arrows right near the ground, uh, you can see that. Um, the blue arrows were kind of sort of originally going straight into the straight into the hill, which physically isn't possible. So once we run that wind field through the solver and adjust to to account for conservation of mass, the the final wind field is actually 
is uh, the flow near the surface is parallel to the surface. So now we have the flow um, parallel to the surface and going up and over the hill instead of trying to go straight into the hill. And so that's, that's basically how the solver works. It requires a good estimate of the initial wind field, and then it adjusts for the terrain, um, enforcing conservation of mass and momentum. Um, and then we have some additional parameterizations for, other, for the uh, thermal parameterizations that I mentioned earlier. So all, all numerical models make some assumptions just because it's not possible to represent all of the processes that are happening at all, at all of the scales. And so these are some of the assumptions. These are the main assumptions that we make in the wind engine model. Um, there are no moisture or latent heat effects. We don't know, the model doesn't know anything about um, rain or thunderstorms, for example. It's a steady state model, so there's no stepping forward in time. We just get one gridded um, simulation um, based on the, the initial wind field that we get it. So there's no, there's no um, stepping forward in time and there's no conservation of energy. Um, the conservation of momentum is optional. I'll talk about that more in just a second. And then we have some optional thermal energy param parameterizations. The advantages to making these assumptions is that uh, the model runs very quickly and there's low computational requirements. So it runs uh, easily on a, on a simple laptop. Uh, the limitations um, that we have for making these assumptions um, is that uh, there's no conservation of energy and we're not um, simulating large scale or complex flow effects. So for example, land, sea breezes or thunderstorms um, aren't, aren't represented in the model. So ultimately, when engine trades explicit computation of more complex physical processes for much higher resolution uh, and faster processing time. And I'm going to talk for just a second about terrain resolution and the importance of terrain resolution in models, because this is really the uh, the reason that we that we make a lot of these assumptions and the reason that we've cho chosen to to focus on getting high resolution. Um, high resolution over some, some of the other uh, sim simulation of some of the other complex physical processes. So here we're just looking at, um, at, at some terrain, you know, there's a few valleys and a couple of, and three and three peaks here. When we, when we represent this terrain in any, in any model, um, we have to do it with a finite number of points because we have limited com computer memory. And so when we represent this real terrain in the model with finite points, there's always some amount of terrain smoothing. Uh, so here I'm showing what the, you know, what it might look like to the computer, um, you know, in our model, if say we choose uh, 14 points to represent this terrain. And you might not think it looks too bad. We're still representing all of the valleys and all of the individual uh, peaks. If we move to 10 points, uh, so maybe this still doesn't look too bad. We're still capturing, you know, all three of the peaks and the valleys. But then if we go down to four points, uh, now things aren't looking so good because we're, you know, representing these, these three individual peaks with, as, just, as just one mountain. And obviously with one point, um, it's, it just looks like a flat, you know, like flat terrain. So in general, uh, you really need four to six cells to resolve any given terrain feature. So if you want to resolve, you know, a certain ridge or a valley, you really need at least four to six cells covering that terrain feature, that ridge or that valley, for it to be represented in the model. And any terrain that's not that's not resolved by the model, um, you know, the effects of that terrain won't be captured in the simulation. So now I'll talk about the the two solvers. So I mentioned that there's two options, and this is new since version 3.0, which was released in May. Um, so we have the conservation of mass solver and the conservation of mass and momentum. And I'll and I'll often refer to these as the native solver and the CFD solver. So the conservation of mass solver is the native solver that's always been in from the the first version that uh, uh, the first release of Wind Ninja. Um, the real uh, benefit to this solver is that it has very fast runtime, so in just seconds. Uh, and we've done some evaluations. We know that it has uh, it improves wind predictions on the windward side and the ridge tops, uh, but it's less accurate on the lee side, particularly just because um, it's not accounting for conservation of momentum. So if you have a, like a lee side eddy or some recirculation on the backside of a terrain feature, Wind Ninja won't 
the, the mass conserving solver, the native solver, won't resolve that recirculation, you'll just see lower speeds. So that's one, that's one downside to the conservation of mass solver. And that's why we, over the last year or two, um, focused on developing this other optional solver, the CFD solver. Um, and what we've seen with it is improved predictions on the least side of terrain features. So now, um, with the conservation of mass solver, mass and momentum solver, the CFD solver, um, you will see it, it is able to capture recirculation on the lee side of, of hills and, and ridges. Um, so you will see that recirculation in the simulated wind field. Um, this solver is still in development. Not all of the options um, in the wind engine framework are available with this solver. For example, um, in the current release, you're only able to do a domain average simulation with the CFD solver. We'll be, con you know, sort of continuously updating this, and eventually, you know, we'll make some of the other options available. In fact, in the next release, I think we'll have the, uh, you'll be able to use this solver with the uh, weather model initialization, for example. Uh, the one downside to the CFD solver, though, is because um, it is more um, computationally expensive to run because of the additional physics that are included. It is slower. So on a typical laptop, run times will be on the order of, you know, 15 minutes to two hours, depending on your, you know, your domain and your computational resources. And so here I'll just give a couple examples um, of of uh, what, how, how the output differs between the two solvers. So this is looking at um, a, a wind simulation with wind coming out of the, out of the southwest um, over an isolated mountain. And th this is the simulation from the native solver. You can see um, some speed up over the ridges, you know, lower speeds in the valleys and on the, on the backside of the, of the mountain. And then if we look at the output from the CFD solver, so this is the exact same simulation but now you can see lower speeds on the, le on the, on the back side of the mountain, on the northeast side. And you can also re see the recirculation. Um, so you can see, um, yeah, recirculation on the back side and also in some of the side drainages. Okay, so now I'll talk about the thermal parameterizations that I mentioned earlier. And I'll, I'll just describe, there's two, and I'll describe how they work. And I'll do it uh, just through an example. And for this example, I'll use um, a bell-shaped hill that's 400 meters tall uh, with a slope angle of 15 degrees. Um, I'm going to give it an ambient uh, input wind uh, at 3 miles per hour from the west. Uh, we're going to assume there's 0% cloud cover. This is with the native solver. Uh, and I'm, this simulation was run uh, for the location is Kalispell, Montana, so north, uh, northwestern Montana uh, in September. And so this slide is showing um, the diurnal wind effects, so the, the slope, um, slope flow effects. So we're looking at, at two different simulations here, one for midday and one for night. And remember, this is zero cloud cover. So midday, uh, there's a lot of incident solar radiation um, heating at the surface, and that causes upslope flow um, sort of on all sides of this bell-shaped hill. And if you remember, we gave it an input wind speed of three miles per hour from the west. So you see the flow, the prevailing flow is moving from left to right. And what happens, because we're, you know, we're also getting that upslope flow effect, is that we get a slightly increased speeds on the, uh, the west side of the hill. And then on the on the east side of the hill, we actually have upslope flow that is opposing the prevailing winds. Um, so we get slower speeds and, and even maybe some redirection, so some actual like recirculation where the flow is, uh, is actually moving in opposition. It's, it's flowing upslope and in opposition to the prevailing wind. On the right-hand side, we're looking at a simulation during the nighttime where we have downslope flow on all sides of the hill. And you can see the opposite effect is true here. So we have the prevailing winds are coming in from the west, but we have downslope flow that's opposing that prevailing wind direction. So you see the lower speeds and downslope flow, uh, so flow that's moving, uh, you know, towards the towards the west on the west side of the hill, and then increased speeds because we have the diurnal slope flow, which is um, sort of getting added on to that the prevailing wind um, on the east side of the hill. 
And then this slide is demonstrating uh, how the, the non-neutral atmospheric stability parameterization works. And basically what happens in, in this parameterization is that under unstable conditions, um, it's easier for an air parcel to sort of move up and over obstacles. And this parameterization, uh, it just uh, it basically gives, it allows the solution more flexibility in the Z direction under unstable conditions so that it's easier for the air parcels to move up and over terrain obstacles. So on the left side, uh, during the, the daytime solution, you can see that there's not a lot of speed up over the ridge. Um, so it's basically um, allowing the air parcel to move up and over the ridge without having to, to speed up. On the right hand side, it's the opposite effect. So in stable conditions, it's, it's more difficult for an air parcel to go up and over um, a terrain obstacle that the air parcel would prefer to go around the obstacle if possible. And so to get up for, for flow that is actually able to get up and over the terrain obstacle, it has to speed up. And so you see that here as a flow is approaching from the west, a lot of the flow is directed um, around the hill, and then the flow that goes up and over um, actually has to speed up um, over the, the center line of the hill to make it over. And so now I'll just mention, um, just briefly, I'll, I'll discuss how WinNinja has been uh, evaluated. When it was first released, um, we did a lot of work to evaluate it with sort of existing data sets um, that were available to us. And most of these data sets have been co collected over sort of low elevation hills, um, focused on um, collecting data for wind energy um, applications. And so, we did some evaluations with this work, and, and basically what we found is that, um, you know, the WinNinja did well in predicting winds on the windward and on the ridgetops and, and had more troubles, more difficulties uh, predicting winds on the lee side. And so we kind of knew that. We wanted to, we also wanted to find, um, wanted to collect some additional data and more complex terrain, because as I mentioned, these are really low elevation hills that we felt aren't really representative of locations, many locations where wildfires often occur. And so over the last several years, um, we've been collecting additional field data from, from different sites um, to, to continue our evaluation work. And so the, the data sets that were previously available really limited um, because due to their terrain complexity, the spatial density of, this, of the instruments that they had out and the, the types of meteorological conditions that were measured. So our goal was to um, you know, collect wind data at high spatial resolution under lots of different types of complex terrain and over a range of meteorological conditions. And I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about that today because we don't have a whole lot of time, but I do have some references listed here. These, you can access these publications if anyone's interested um, directly from our webpage. I'll just mention um, a few details just to give you an overview of, of the types of um, measurements that we made and the types of terrain that we were making them in. But we, um, we've done a number of these field campaigns now where we uh, focused on measuring near surface winds um, w using a dense array of cup and vane anemometers. So we were collecting uh, three meters, so roughly 10 foot wind speed and direction. We deployed about 30 to 60 sensors, um, 60 of these sensors at, at each site. Uh, we also made some other measurements um, like with 3D sonic anemometers to um, characterize turbulence and uh, sodars and radio sound launches to characterize uh, vertical wind profiles. And we've gone to several sites now. Most of them have been in Idaho, but they've been in different types of terrain. I'll talk about these first two, uh, Big Southern Butte and the Salmon River Canyon um, in a little more detail here. But we also went to the Priest River Experimental Forest in Northern Idaho. It's a dissected drainage with a tall forest canopy and the Birch Creek Valley in Southern Idaho. So Big Southern Butte is a, is a tall isolated mountain in uh, Southeastern Idaho. Uh, it's mostly grass and sagebrush. And you can see this kind of this graphic here on the bottom right kind of gives you an idea of how we um, the sort of the spatial density of the sensors that we had out there. So we put out uh, around 60 of these surface wind sensors and in this figure here on the bottom right, the Google Earth image, each of those little flags is a surface sensor. And we had those out for about three months, just continuously uh, measuring measuring data. 
Uh, here's the second site that I mentioned, the Salmon River Canyon. So this is pretty different terrain than the, the isolated mountain in southeast Idaho. The blue lines here are just kind of deline delineating some of the major um, the major valleys and and uh, and and rivers in this um, in the area. The red circle is highlighting the study area. So it's sort of you know a steep, deep river canyon surrounded by complex terrain. This is an image taken from the site. And then here's the the uh, layout of sensors that we had. So we had around uh, 30 sensors here. We had sort of three transects that ran from the ridge top on either side of the river down to the down to the river bottom. And so, you know, through these studies, basically what we found um, is that in, in all the cases that we've measured so far, um, almost always the near surface winds are, are often decoupled from the larger scale flows due to mechanical and, and thermal effects. And, you know, this means that a large scale mean flow, like a, something that you might get from a, a core scale weather model, um, those predictions wouldn't really be representative of surface winds in most locations. So the evaluations that we've done of, of Wind Ninja so far have shown that um, Wind Ninja performs well, especially on the windward, on the windward side and on ridge tops, uh, when the domain average winds are predicted well. So if the weather model is able, a weather model, or or we have some other information that we're able to prescribe uh, a reasonable initialization wind, um, then the the Wind Ninja high resolution gridded simulations. Um, tend to compare well with observations, particularly on the, the windward side of terrain features and on the ridge tops. We still have trouble. Um, the largest errors are, are on the lee side of terrain obstacles. And this is still ongoing work. We're still continuing these evaluations. We have more field, um, field campaigns planned. Um, so there'll be um, more to come from that work. And so now I just want to sort of switch gears and talk about some of the other features that Wind Ninja has to offer that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, one of the, um, I think one of the cool things about the framework is that it, it has sort of a lot of things built into it. Um, for example, um, we provide really simple access um, to data, including weather model forecasts, digital elevation models, land fire data, the, the landscape files, um, and, and soon uh, weather station data via the, the Meso West network. And you know all of this information, um, all of this data is available to anyone that wants to sort of go out and, and look for it. But, but these, all of this information comes from sort of different places. And so I think it's nice to have a simple tool with a simple interface that you know, just by using like this Google Maps interface here that I'm showing on the bottom right, you know, you can just sort of sweep out an area and say, give me all this data. Uh, and so that's kind of handy. We also provide, uh, you know, easy to use outputs, what I already kind of touched on that earlier, but, you know, inputs that can directly be used for fire behavior simulations. Um, you can view our outputs in Google Earth. We also allow you to view the weather model, um, weather model data in Google Earth, which is pretty handy. And then I, I mentioned the GeoPDS earlier too. So I want to talk for just a second about the weather models that are accessible through through Wind Ninja. So we provide access to a number. I think we have 15 here. These are all the models that are available through Wind Ninja. And we get these models uh, from two different places, from two different servers. Uh, one is from the Nomad server, which is from, it's provided by the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. And the other server where we can get data from is uh, UCAR, the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. And there is a little bit of overlap between the two servers. Um, some of them, some of these models are the same, um, but some of them are different. And I guess I'll just I'll talk about a couple here. Um, so it can be maybe hard to choose it, when you just sort of jump into this, and if you don't know anything about the different models, it can be sort of hard to pick, um, you know, which which one is best for your case. And they all have sort of pros and cons. Um, for example, the UCAR NDFD um, at the top here, this is a model that's um, provided by the National Weather Service. And it's kind of an interesting, it's different than any of the other models because it's not actually a, it's not a single model forecast. It's not a, it's not just a single model, but instead it's, um, the NDFD is, 
is a model that's put out um, by uh, each. So each of the National Weather Service locations actually um, puts out their own forecast and then sends it to um, the headquarters, which is somewhere on the East Coast. And the headquarters sort of stitches it all together and then puts out this two and a half kilometer uh, model that we fetch. But the kind of interesting thing about this model is that the individual weather service locations um, can have some sort of interaction. They can, there's some human intervention, I guess, in this model. So they can sort of tweak, they can blend different models together. They can look at observations, you know, if they know there's a certain part of their domain with some, where, you know, there's always, you know, something that happens, they can sort of tweak things before they send it off to the, to the, uh, to the national um, headquarters for incorporation into the larger model. So the NDFD is kind of a unique one and it's, it's only provided by UCAR. Uh, the GFS model is the only global model that we have. So if you're doing simulations outside of the US, this is probably uh, the model that you'll be using. Um, it also goes out the, the longest um, in time. I think it goes out to 384 hours. Uh, and then the HER model, I'm going to talk about that. So the HER model is uh, the high resolution rapid refresh. And this is the highest uh, resolution model. It's at three kilometers. And I'm going to talk about it more in detail here because the HER model, a lot of people maybe don't know this, um, but it's really different from the other models because it's really the only one that's operationally available um, that has that's able to sort of directly simulate convection and thunderstorms. And so we've been spending some time uh, trying to evaluate um, the HER um, in these types of situations, so sort of prediction of short-lived atmospheric boundaries, particularly those associated with convection like thunderstorms. And so right here I'm showing an example from our data. Um, on the right-hand side you can see an animation of an observed wind field. So these are observations from our surface uh, surface sensor network that we had in the Birch Creek Valley. And it's measuring um, what we think is a thunderstorm outflow event um, that happened in the Birch Creek Valley. So right here, it's showing winds going sort of up the valley. And then right now, you can see the flow start is switching. It's, it's going down valley. And you can see this gust front sort of propagate through the valley and out onto the Snake River Plain. And if you look on the left-hand side, uh, you can see observed and her predicted uh, base reflectivity. So you can see that there were some, you know, some thunderstorm cells um, observed by the uh, the uh, the radar, um, the Pocatello radar, and also and the her was, um, you know, the the base reflectivity modeled in the her actually matches the observed base reflectivity uh, surprisingly well. I think so. We thought that was pretty encouraging. And if you look at the HER forecast at the, at the just the 10 meter winds from the HER forecast for that event, if you look at the forecast that they put out at noon, so this gust front, the observed front happened, you know, it passed through our stations and onto the Snake River Plain in about three hours. And if you look at the HER forecast, um, you can see that gust front propagate through um, at, at about the right time frame also. So in the first, uh, you know, at 1400, it's showing, you know, up valley kind of low wind speeds. At 1500, you can see the gust front sort of starting to emerge in the valley. And then at 1600, you can see it's propagated out. It's getting, uh, the speeds are higher. There's some sort of red arrows there right at the outlet of the valley. And then it's by 1700, it's, it's um, you know, move, moved out of the valley and onto the Snake River Plain. And so far, this matches really well with, with what we observed on site. So um, I think that looks pretty promising. And so now I'll just touch on some of the new stuff that's going on with, uh, with Wind Ninja. So we released a mobile application um, in July, and it's currently available in both Google Play and iTunes. And the mobile app is, um, it's a simplified, basically a simplified interface to the desktop version. It's really designed for on the ground uh, firefighters. So people um, who are maybe in the field and don't have um, easy access to a laptop. Um, so this is, this is the, um, it's, uh, so it's a simplified interface. It doesn't have all the options that the desktop version has. Um, but, uh, 
but it's got the the main functionality is is in there and we offer for example um you know t a few different um initialization methods there's a couple of different weather models that you can use to initialize it and then you can view the output right there in the in the application so we'll continue with this. Uh, we got some good feedback from this fire season um, and we're gonna continue to develop it over this winter and then hopefully, hopefully put out another, um, another release of the mobile app uh, later this spring. Um, so also coming up later this spring, we will put out another version of the desktop. Um, of the desktop application, it'll be version 3.2, and this will include some enhancements for the momentum solver, including the ability to use uh, the weather model initialization with that solver. Uh, we'll also be including the ability to auto fetch uh, weather station data via the MesoWest or Synoptic Labs um, system for point initialization runs. So that means you won't have to, uh, if you want to do a point initialization run, you don't have to. Um, bring your own um, station files into the application anymore. We'll have the ability to just sort of go out and fetch that data from a server, which I think will be really handy. We also have a couple, couple of experimental features in development. Um, so one is a, a local scale smoke transport model. I'm showing some example output from, from that model on the right hand side of the, of the uh, slide here. And the uh, the goal for this is re we're really targeting uh, prescribed burns. So the especially the local district around here in Missoula has been really concerned about um, trying to be able to anticipate where the smoke will go. Especially when you know Missoula is, sits down in a in a valley, and a lot of the prescribed burns. Um, are taking place sort of up in the foothills and there's a lot of concern you know a lot of their burns get shut down because there's uh, air quality concerns about the smoke coming back down into the valley and so we've been trying to work with them to see if we can incorporate uh, sort of a smoke transport and dispersion model into Wininja to allow them um, some capability of, of uh, you know, predicting what might happen so that they can have a better conversation with some of the air quality regulators. And, um, but like I said, this is, uh, I would say this is, we have an early version of it, but it's definitely still experimental. We're still sort of playing around with um, the best way to approach this. And we collected a little bit of data here during a local prescribed burn and did some initial evaluations. And I think we have some ideas for how to move forward. And so hopefully in the next year or so, we'll have, have more to say about that. Um, along those same lines, we're also looking at doing a similar thing to simulate particle transport um, for for embers, um, firebrands during during fires. Okay, so so now I think we still have time. Um, I'm gonna just go through a quick um, a quick demo of the app. Let's see. Okay. Yep, that works. So I've got the, yeah. So I've got the uh, the Wind Ninja application is open here. So this is just the desktop version. Uh, this is what you see as soon as you launch the application. And so the first the first thing to do is to sort of you know select which solver you want to use. Um, and today, just in the interest of time, we'll do the conservation of mass server just because it runs quicker. And You'll notice, so if, if you, if this is the first time that you've ever launched the app and you've, you, you know, you don't really know anything about it, you haven't even read any of the tutorials, you could probably just sort of click your way through this menu and sort of figure it out. I feel like it's pretty intuitive. But we do, um, if you go to help up here in the toolbar, um, we have links right here to all of the tutorials. And I would really recommend if, if it is the first time that someone is using the application to just sort of read through these tutorials. They're pretty easy to follow. They're pretty short. Um, and they provide a lot of information about the different options and um, you know how, how things work and, and what different features are, are designed to do. OK, so we'll select conservation of mass. Um, the next thing to do is to select your uh, input parameters. So the first thing that we ask for is your elevation input. If you already have a file, you can just open open it, navigate um, to where it is on your hard drive and select it. Or you can click download a file and it pops up this Google, um, Google, uh, Google Maps 
image and you can sort of pan around navigate to where you want to go and then just sort of draw a box and uh, pick the elevation source so we have a few different options if you're in the u.s we have 30 meter dms if you're somewhere else in the world um, we have uh, 90 meter data for some locations or 250 meters uh, basically you can get for anywhere anywhere in the world uh, and then a landscape file and if uh, some people may not know what a landscape file is. So the landscape file um, includes both gridded elevation data and also some information about the vegetation. So you basically just, you know, delineate your box, say download file, um, and in a few seconds, depending on your connection speed, you'll have um, the DM or the landscape file will be downloaded to your hard drive. I'm not actually going to do that here, just in the interest of time, because I already have a, I already have a, file here that we can use and so i'm using a landscape file here it has the extension lcp and so under vegetation it's telling me you know i don't need to make a selection because the vegetation is already set using the landscape file um, so now we can select the mesh resolution um, you can choose between coarse medium or or fine or you can say i want to do a custom uh, custom resolution and you can you know directly set it here to you know be whatever you want if you want a, a final output of uh, or a, you know if you want to run your simulation at uh, 50 meter horizontal resolution you can specify that here um, the finer the simulation you run um, the more you know the more individual points you're simulating in the model so it'll it'll run slower it'll take more um you know more res more resources to do the simulation so for for now just to keep things fat things fast i'm going to do this course simulation okay so then here we have a couple of options to you know either turn on or off the diurnal instability um, options i'm just going to go ahead and turn those on uh, then for the wind input we have the three options that i mentioned can specify a domain average. Um, you can supply um, a, a weather station file and do a point initialization, um, or you can choose to do a weather model simulation, and that's that's what I'll do here. So I selected weather model initialization, and now the next step is just to pick which model I want to use. And so here we have them all listed. And then as you as you're reading through these, if you're not sure, you know, okay, what's, uh, you know, what's UCAR NDFD, if you go um, back to that, I think it's tutorial four that I was showing earlier that you can get to through the help. I ha we have that table, the one that I showed in the presentation that describes what each of these is, um, you know, what their resolution is, what the temporal resolution is, how often they're run, et cetera. Um, you can always refer to the tutorial to get that info. For this simulation, um, I'll just pick the HER and then I'll say, we'll do simulate just through like two hours from now. I'll say download data. So it's going out to the server, fetching the data. Okay. So it's got it. And so I have a few things are showing up for me in this window right here. And it's because I have some other, um, some other weather models that I downloaded earlier and it's just showing me all the ones that are available. It looks like this is the one that we just downloaded. So I'm going to open that folder and then this zip file, this is the forecast. So that's what we're going to use. And you can see we got a green check mark um, in the next to the weather model option now. So now I'm going to click on the output tab. And so here we have a few options um, to set uh, you know what how we want the output to come to us and i'm just going to say sure let's get the outputs at 20 feet above the ground and out, output speed units we'll leave that in miles per hour uh, the option here uh, right raw weather model output i'm going to leave that checked what that's going to do is uh, in addition to the wind engine simulation it's also going to write a file a, um, a file that we can view um, the the raw weather model input, the input that goes into Wind Ninja, so that we can view that also. And for output products, I'm just going to select Google Earth, and I'm just going to sort of uh, use all of, the, all of the default values. And then I'm going to say Solve. And should just take a few seconds here, and it's done. So we'll say OK. Then I'm going to open the output file. 
And so there were a few time steps. I said, uh, if you remember when we downloaded that forecast, I said, let's go out from two hours for now. So it did that and it looks like it grabbed um, four different time steps. So I'm just gonna open the first one. It looks like it's for, it's actually for 10 o'clock. So it grabbed one from, from a little bit earlier, but we'll go ahead and just open that. Okay, so here's the wind engine output. And I'm also just gonna go ahead and open the raw weather model, the raw weather model file too. Make sure I get the same time step. Okay, so you can see the course, you know, the, the, the HER forecast is sort of overlaid on top of the wind ninja forecast. Uh, so, you, so now you can kind of zoom in and, and pan around. You can see, you know, some of the, the speed up over ridges um, and um, lower speeds in the valleys. Um, so, and you can, you know, obviously turn these layers on and off now. Um, so yeah, that's a quick intro to the model and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. So, okay, I think we're out of my screen. And yeah, now I'd be happy to take some questions um, if we still have some time to do Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, once again, if you joined us during the webinar, the presentation, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. And we just had a great presentation by Dr. Natalie Wagenbrenner with the Missoula Fire Science Lab at the uh, Forest Service. Uh, talking about wind ninjas. So we do have some time left in our hour today to, to take questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat window uh, and we'll try and address those. Uh, and I see uh, we had a couple that have already come in. Uh, and, and John Walker had a question about blending. Uh, is there a, an option or in, anything in the works to blend that point initialization and then some of the weather models so you get sort of the best of both worlds? We haven't considered that. So yeah, so you're asking about, yeah, blending the the point and so sort of observed data and the weather model initialization. Yeah, we haven't one, yeah. uh, we haven't thought about that, but that uh, that's an interesting idea. And then yeah. uh, another one comes in uh, from Joe uh, asking about do any of the weather models uh, do the do the models that come in, do those incorporate the terrain features? Yep, good question. Sure, so the, the weather models do incorporate terrain features, but only to the degree that they can resolve them by their grids. So for example, with the HER model, uh, you know, it has a horizontal spatial resolution of three kilometers. So it's only gonna be representing terrain features that are, um, you know, coarser than, than three kilometers. And remember it's, it, it takes, you know, four to six grid cells to, in, to resolve any given terrain feature. So so they're only representing terrain that's captured by, you know, a few, you know, three kilometer grid cells. So here's another one that came in from Kate and she asked, what spatial scale do you recommend analysis not to exceed? So in other words, uh, how big of an area could be analyzed at a time? Yeah, so here I think the question is really, so a couple of things. Uh, one is your computational resources because okay. the bigger, um, the bigger domain that you try to simulate, if you want to, if you want to keep, so say you have a 50 by 50 kilometer domain, but you want to do, um, you know, simulations at, at 30 meters, that's a lot more cells in that 50 by 50 kilometer domain than if you're doing the simulation at 200 meters. So it depends on how fine you want the simulation to be, how fine you want the grid to be, the individual cells. Um, and that's going to depend on your computational resources. So the other option you have, you know, if you if you want to simulate a large area, but you also want to have fine, uh, really fine resolution, and you and you can't simulate the whole area at once at the resolution that you want, so you can always you can always break it up into sort of smaller chunks and do them individually. And then Phil from Blacksburg National Weather Service says uh, for the point point initiation, can you use eye level wind measurements? inputs from folks on the ground? Uh, 
So for that type of uh, for that type of information, if you just have you know information at one point like this, uh, you probably just want to do the domain average initialization. Uh, and in that case, you just you just input the uh, the wind speed and direction and the height above ground that the measurement was made. Now I see one uh, follow up from John, and he says, "Have you considered using wind observations uh, from UAS or I guess UAVs, i.e., drones, uh, to both use as the point input into Wind Ninja, and or two to help validate the model in three dimensions?" Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not so in terms of of using it to uh, as a point input. Um, maybe I guess I'm not. Well, I'm not familiar with that. You know, with that data or how it's collected or. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms, so if someone had this data and they wanted to to do a point initialization with it, um, I guess it, it depends on on what information they have. Um, I'm trying to think here. So for us to be able to um, to implement something that that we could, uh, you know, for example, comparing it to like the weather model initializations, um, we would need we would need the data to sort of be somewhere on a server that we can access and get get a hold of it to do to do to allow other you know other people in different locations to do these simulations. If you're talking about just like an individual that happens to have access to that data to do the simulations, um, I, I think it would be totally possible if you can get it into the format that's required by our point initialization format that's described in in the point initialization tutorial, and it's just a simple. CSV file um, where you have for each station um, some different information you need like a lat long and the Z location of the measurement uh, so if you could if you had data that you could you know sort of get it into that format then I don't see why you couldn't do that and one more that that uh, just came in from M. Colburn at the local, are the local scale transport models available at this time or is that something that was planned for the spring? Yeah, so that's still, that's planned for sometime in the future, probably not even this spring. It's probably going to be a little bit later before it's um, ready for an official release of any kind. Uh, it's still really an experimental um, feature, very much still in the development phase, but we do hope that we will have something, um, a final product soonish hopefully in the next year. Uh, a question that I was curious about, does the the, the terrain model, does it, it, working off DEMs, does it also um, model sort of depressional features in the landscape? So if you have uh, canyons or, or um, mm -hmm. basins, sort of negative features as opposed to these um, positive elevation features? Yep, as long uh, as long as that whatever the feature is, as long as it's represented in the DEM, and for the most part they are. Like the the DEMs that we access, um, for instance, that thirty meter DEM that we looked at in the GUI is from the is SRTM, so the mm -hmm. um, yep. yeah the shuttle yeah yep. And so as long as it's data, as long as it's um, a terrain feature that can be captured by the, at that thirty meter scale, then for sure it will be it would be captured. And similar to that, uh, Mark asks, does it model the effects of bodies of water? So, no. Well, uh, to us, you know, to the model, um, a body of water will just look like um, flat terrain. And we don't make mm -hmm. any adjustment for, like, the surface roughness or anything. Surface roughness, yep. Yeah, nope. Gotcha. And, and then uh looks like we... Let's take this as our last question for this afternoon. And John Cook, too, as when you add landscape data with the vegetation, does that impact the forecast? So are you getting surface roughness? Yes. And the way, so I guess one thing to mention is that um, the, way the, the way the vegetation is accounted for in the model is really just to adjust the surface roughness. Um, so, so the difference if you're using a landscape file where you have gridded vegetation is that you'll have gridded, uh, a gridded roughness versus if you, if you use just like a uniform, just like, you know, you say it's brush or, or grass. Um, 
over the whole landscape, then you just have sort of one single roughness value. And the way that that roughness value is used is really just in setting the sort of initialization profile um, above the ground. And the, you know, the actual outputs that come out of Wind Ninja are always above the vegetation. So when we say 20 feet as an output product, it's always above the vegetation. So if it's, if it's, if the vegetation is, is grass and it's, you know, just 20 feet above the ground, but if it's, you know, a tall canopy, it's 20 feet, you know, above the trees. And the reason that we do that is because uh, most of the fire models, that's what they require is, um, you know, like a 20 foot, 20 foot wind where 20 feet is, is measured above the vegetation. But we do have in the works plans uh, to incorporate a, a new within canopy model that we've been developing here, some other collaborators here. And at some point we will incorporate that into Wind Ninja so that you could actually estimate um, the, the, uh, the wind speed within the profile based on, you know, based on that gridded information and what the, what the canopy looks like in the landscape file at a certain point on the landscape. All right. Outstanding. All right. Well, well, it looks like we've come up to the end of our time today. And uh, Natalie, I'd, I'd definitely like to thank you for, for taking the time to put together this presentation and joining us. Um, I know I really enjoyed your presentation and, and we had a good turnout today and, and I think everybody else did too. So, so on behalf of everybody, uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.